Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street from Easter. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Easter podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's author of best-selling books, Currency Wars and the Death of Money. He's here to talk about his new book, The New Case for Gold. James Rickers, thank you for joining me again. Great to be with you, Jason. Now, Jim, uh, why do you think so many people on Wall Street don't understand or hate gold? Well, it's not just Wall Street. It's uh, actually throughout the United States. It's interesting. I find that uh, people abroad have a better understanding of gold than most Americans do. But uh, it's basically 40 years of miseducation. You know, 1971 was, uh, well, 1933 was the last time um, Americans, American citizens were on a gold standard. 1971 was the last time the United States was on a gold standard vis-a-vis -vis its uh, trading partners abroad. Since then, uh, really two generations of economists uh, led by uh, big names like Milton Friedman and then followed on by other prominent economists, Joe Stiglitz, Paul Krugman, uh, Nouriel Rabini, uh, Marty Feldstein, uh, have taught over and over that uh, gold has no place in the monetary system. It's not elastic. It's not able to expand the money supply in times of crisis. It's uh, the famous Keynes phrase, uh, it's a barbarous relic, etc. So you have literally generations of very bright uh, college students and uh, everyday Americans who have been taught that Gold is uh, something from the past and has no place in the monetary system. Now, every one of the things I just said is wrong, um, and I explain this in the book. I take, um, you know, my book is called The New Case for Gold, uh, and that's what most of the book is about. But in the in the introduction to the book, I take these arguments against gold that have been repeated ad nauseum, that have been taught to generations of students, and I demonstrate uh, with evidence why every one of them is wrong uh, or obsolete in some way. So uh, it's a little bit of... You can call it brainwashing, uh, miseducation, uh, conditioning. Uh, and then you say, well, why is that? What's behind that? Well, of course, you know, the, the PhDs and the central bankers, they would like uh, a fiat money standard because they control it. You can't control gold. I mean, you've got to go dig it up and mine it, and it's a costly process, and mining output grows about 1.6% a year. So it, there's nothing you can do to make that, uh, you know, a lot faster. Uh, there's only so much gold around, and it's costly to produce. So... So people, uh, it's basically a power grab by those who are, you know, control the levers of the money supply. And I don't think it's any secret that if you control money, you control behavior, you control politics, you control economics. So the PhDs have taken over money, but they and they've taught everyone that gold has no place. But if you actually read my book, The New Case for Gold, you'll see very clearly that gold can be a very um, effective and efficient uh, form of money. There's nothing inconsistent about a gold standard and an elastic money supply. Uh, there's nothing um, unique uh, about gold that, that causes panics. You have panics with a gold standard. You have panics without a gold standard. Uh, gold has nothing to do with financial panic. So there's there's a very strong case for it, and it's all in the book, and I hope people uh, read it and, um, and learn from it. Yeah, I think those are great points. And, you know, there's a lot of academic literature out there by Keynesians and Milton Freeman and stuff blaming gold for the 1929 depression. and and things like that. And then we also have the Warren Buffett view on gold that which is, you know, conventional value investors that it doesn't provide cash flow. But I view gold as money. And I think I've heard you in other interviews do, too. So uh, it just it's confusing to me why more people don't go to it in times of economic volatility, like what we're having right now in the markets. Well, gold is money and money is not supposed to have a cash flow. Uh, so take, uh, you know, reach in your wallet or your purse and pull out a dollar bill and hold it up with two hands and look at it. Does it have yield? No. <laughs> no. No, it doesn't have yield. Neither does gold. Gold has no yield. You know, Warren Buffett uh, is the king of uh, tax deferred compounding, and good for him. He's made uh, you know tens of billions of dollars out of it. Uh, but um, and, and but you do that by taking risk. In other words, Warren Buffett is very good at assessing risk and return, and that that is how you get return by taking risk. But when you have money, 
uh, at least a sound form of money, you don't have any risk. And so um, uh, the idea that gold, gold has no yield, well, that's literally true, but it's not supposed to have a yield because it's, it's money. Now, you say, well, I can get yield on my dollars by putting them in the bank. That's true. And people think of it as money, but that's not money anymore. When you put your dollar in a bank, uh, it's not money. It's a, it's a bank deposit, which is an unsecured liability of banks that as recently as 2008 and even later were completely insolvent. Now, yes, they were bailed out by the federal government. There's FDIC insurance, and I understand that. But some deposits, many for wealthier individuals or those with savings or uh, corporations or other entities, institutions, certainly, uh, their deposits are well in excess of the insured limit. Uh, even if you're under the insured limit, how do you know the insurance uh, deposit insurance corporation itself is solvent? Uh, that's not always true. How do you know that bank withdrawals won't be suspended or reduced as they were in Greece and Cyprus recently? And then people say, well, that would never happen in the United States. And I point out it did happen in the United States in 1933. Uh, there was an eight-day bank holiday. Banks were, by executive order of the president of the United States, banks were shut. Um, the government did not say when uh, they would reopen. It turned out they, they reopened eight days later, but for eight days you couldn't go down to the bank and get your money. People say, well, I've got money in money market funds. Another misnomer or oxymoron because uh, the SEC recently issued a rule saying that money market funds can suspend redemption. So everyday Americans think that they can um, you know, call up their broker, sell their money market fund units. The money will be wired to their account and it will be available to them the next day. Well, that's a nice, warm, cozy assumption, but none of those assumptions are necessarily true. First of all, money market funds were uh, in the process of becoming illiquid in 2008, and the government stepped in to bail them out. Today, they, they're allowed to suspend redemptions just like a hedge fund, so they don't have to give you your money. Even if they do and send it to the bank, who's to say the bank ATMs won't be reprogrammed to only give you, let's say, $300 a day for gas and groceries in a financial panic when there's a run on the bank? And, and again, people say none of these things will happen, and I just point out they, they have all happened. So I don't recommend... Um, I don't rec recommend taking all your money out of the bank or selling all your stocks or cashing in everything and buying 100% gold. What I recommend is uh, about 10% gold, 10% of your investable assets. By investable assets, I mean uh, those are the assets uh, other than your home equity and your business equity. So if you're you know, a car dealer or a pizza parlor operator, a dry cleaner, a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, whatever, that's your livelihood. So you know, put that equity to one side, put your home equity to one side. Whatever's left, those are your investable assets. Take about 10%, get gold. That's your insurance policy. So if it's, you know, happy days are here again, the gold might not do very much. But if everything else burns down, you'll be very happy you have the gold. And to add to your points there, the negative interest rate policy that's being discussed by members of the Federal Reserve. So dollars that were earning yield in the past with the higher interest rates, with financial repression, with potential negative interest rate policy, you know, those those yields, they're going to go away. So, <laughs> well, that, well, that's um, right. I point out that, you know, gold has no yield, which is true. But in a world of negative interest rates, gold is a high yield asset because zero is greater than negative two. Exactly. And financial repression, it seems all the major economies, Japan, Europe, the United States, even China now is in the financial repression game. Absolutely. By the way, Jason, one point you mentioned earlier, uh, we kind of skipped over that. And you're right. Economists say that gold caused the Great Depression. That's also nonsense. And I explain why in my book. First of all, it's been very well studied by um, by uh, Milton Friedman, Anna Schwartz, Ben Bernanke and other scholars. And I actually spoke to Ben Bernanke about this personally because um, I read his uh, book um, uh, on the Great Depression, and that, that 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 is how he made his scholarly reputation long before he was on the Board of Governors or even Chairman of the Federal Reserve. He was, you know, an academic economist at Princeton, and his academic reputation, as they say, was built on his study of the Great Depression, following in the footsteps of Friedman and Schwartz. And he said that gold was never a constraint on the money supply. There's this canard out there, this nonsense that. You know, uh, if only the Fed had printed more money in the Great Depression, we could have avoided the Great Depression. That was the lesson that Ben, ben Bernanke applied uh, when he experimented with QE1, QE2, and QE3. Um, but that's not true because um, – and they said, well, we couldn't print the money because we had a gold standard. Well, it's not true. There was a gold standard in the Great Depression. The law allowed the money supply to be two and a half times the amount of gold. At the time, it was valued at $20.67 an ounce. So take, take the amount of official gold. That held by the Federal Reserve at the time, multiply by twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents an ounce, and then multiply that by two and a half, and that was the legal money supply. Well, the actual money supply, and Bernanke's research shows this, uh, shows that the money supply never exceeded one hundred percent of the gold, which means that you could have more than doubled the money supply. The ceiling was two and a half times; it never went over about one times. 
So um, the Fed could have more than doubled the money supply uh, with ease and not have violated the law on a gold standard. And this is the point I make, that you can have a gold standard and discretionary monetary policy side by side. So I read that and I was kind of blown away. I was like, well, that proves that gold did not constrain the money supply. What did constrain the money supply was the Fed and the banks. It was bad, bad central bank policy, unwillingness of banks to lend, unwillingness of individuals to borrow. By the way, the same problems that plague us today. Um, the, the problem is not a shortage of money. The problem is lack of velocity, lack of lending and spending. That's a psychological, socio-psychological uh, problem. That's not a gold problem. But we're having the same problem today with low growth that you had in the Great Depression with negative growth, but none of it has anything to do with gold. So when I spoke to Bernanke, I said, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, here's how I read your research. Uh, do I have it right? And he said, yeah, you have it right. So, uh, so I got it straight from the horse's mouth. So, so gold did not cause the Great Depression. Gold did not constrain money supply during the Great Depression. Uh, you can have discretionary monetary policy and a gold standard side by side. But again, people believe the myth that the kind of questions you're asking, Jason, you know, didn't gold cause the Great Depression? Everyone will tell you it did. It's not true. Um, people will say, uh, you know, there's not enough gold to support trade and commerce. That's not true. It's, but again, I, I start out the book knocking down these uh, bogus arguments, and then we expand from there to give uh, the readers um, a lot of reasons why a gold standard can work. And then, again, in my book, The New Case for Gold, I say, look, even if central banks and the IMF don't want a gold standard, you can go on a personal gold standard. You can personally protect your wealth, personally protect your hard-earned savings by buying some gold, uh, putting it in safe storage for yourself. And I guess I call it the, uh, you don't have to wait for a central bank gold standard. You can go on a personal gold standard. Yeah, that, that's a good point. There's a lot of options available to do that. And the other thing about the uh, Great Depression, I read a book by Murray Rothbard called America's Great Depression. You know, there were wage and price controls. There was interventionist policies from Herbert Hoover that FDR only magnified even further. Sure. There was smooth, there were smooth Hawley tariffs. There was trade wars and things like that. And there was currency wars then, too. Uh, my next question is, why are China and Russia buying so much physical gold? Well, it's a good question. I mean, that just to be not to be glib, but uh, either they're stupid or they know something we don't. <laughs> so I, I, I know a lot of Russians. I know Chinese. I've been to Beijing, Shanghai, Moscow. Uh, they're not stupid, right? These are some of the smartest, savviest, most forward-leaning players on earth. So obviously they know what they're doing. Uh, but on a more serious note, I've spoken to um, – Senior officials at the IMF. I've spoken to senior officials in the U.S. intelligence community. I've, I've had discussions about this at the Pentagon. Um, clearly, what they're doing is diversifying away from the dollar. Uh, and, and a lot of, you know, the the more conspiracy-minded people say, well, they're they're trying to come up with a new global currency backed by gold, and they're going to run the dollar off the road. In fact, that is the scenario I played out um, in the first financial war game ever done at a top secret weapons laboratory between Washington and Baltimore. I was a facilitator and a participant in that game. I wrote about that in my first book, Currency Wars. Uh, we did that scenario because we wanted to try to open the Pentagon's eyes a little bit as to what was possible. But in fact, uh, I don't think that's what they're trying to do. They, they've, they might have that as a plan B or a plan C. But what they are trying to do is diversify away from dollars. So you sit there and you know, take China, for example, I mean, they're bleeding reserves. First of all, their the reserve position has dropped from about four trillion dollars to about three point two trillion dollars in the past fifteen months. So that's a, a twenty percent loss in their reserves. Of the three point two trillion they have left, approximately two trillion of that is U.S. dollar denominated, and over half of that, uh, specifically, is in U.S. government securities, treasuries, and mortgage-backed securities, et cetera. Now, they fear, and I think rightly, that we're going to try to inflate our way out from under our debt. That's the American way. Like we always, we don't actually default. We just inflate the currency away. So we say to China, here's your trillion dollars. Good luck buying a loaf of bread. Um, but, um, and there's not much they can do about it. They say, why don't they dump the treasuries? Well, they can. I mean, the treasury market is large, but it's not that large. It can't absorb that much selling. Um, and these immediately have to mark down the securities. So the reserve position would be less. They'd be shooting themselves in the foot. Um, and then finally, if it became malicious or, a threat, the um, the president can stop it with one phone call because the president has emergency powers to freeze accounts whenever there's a um, uh, you know a foreign uh, financial threat. So for all those reasons, they can't dump the treasuries. But what they can do is buy gold, which they're doing by the thousands of tons. By the way, these are enormous purchases that are going on. And so you sit there with your big pile of treasuries and your big pile of gold. Now. 
China is the greatest friend of the dollar. China doesn't want to destroy the dollar. They they want a strong dollar because if you had two trillion dollars of U.S. dollar denominated paper, you you'd want a strong dollar too. But um, so they say, look, if the U.S. maintains the value of the dollar, our gold might not do very much, but our securities will be worth uh, you know worth face value, and uh, we'll we'll treat that as a very valuable reserve. But if the U.S. does inflate the dollar and does destroy the value of the paper, what's going to happen to the gold? It's going to skyrocket. So what you have is a hedge position where if the dollar is stable, you don't make much on the gold, but your treasuries are worth something. If the dollar is inflated, your treasuries are devalued, but your gold skyrockets. So it's it's a hedge position. So it's a way to diversify the reserves without having to dump treasuries. Um, it's what Warren Buffett did when he bought Geico back in um, in the 1990s. He you know he had a big stock portfolio. And he wanted to diversify into bonds. And a lot of people would have said, well, sell your stocks and buy the bonds. And he said, no, I'll issue Berkshire Hathaway stock and buy an insurance company with a bunch of bonds inside. And that way he diversified his portfolio without selling the existing assets. Well, China's doing the same thing. They're not dumping the treasuries. They're just buying gold. And then they sit there with both sides of the – it's like a seesaw. They own both sides of the seesaw. One goes up, the other goes down. But they have a – they maintain the value. Uh, Russia, I think, probably is more strategic. Uh, they don't have all that many dollars to nominate reserves to begin with. They have a lot of euros. They do have some dollars, of course, but uh, they, they're buying gold because I think they see uh, continued financial warfare with the United States and they want to reduce their vulnerabilities to uh, freezes. I mean, the president can freeze Treasury securities because we, we in the United States control Fedwire. We control the, the digital registry. We control the dollars to nominate payment system. But we can't control physical gold. And so Putin, I think, very intelligently is saying, All right, I'm going to buy the asset that the, that the U.S. can't control, and that gives me more degrees of freedom. So some of it's economic, some of it's strategic, but not, but all of it is very, um, very well thought out. And what I say to U.S. investors is, hey, if it's good enough for China and Russia, why isn't it good enough for you? Now, Jim, do you think the Shanghai Gold Exchange will allow for real price discovery in the gold market? Well, it's uh, – it's always good to have competition. I think it is good to have another source of price discovery. But, you know, there are bigger forces at play here, including, um, uh, you know, official sales. Uh, you know, we saw in, the, in 1999, the UK dumped its gold. In the early 2000s, uh, Switzerland dumped uh, over 1,000 tons of gold. In 2010, the IMF dumped 400 tons of gold. Uh, recently, Canada became the first major developed economy to go to zero gold. I, I just, they didn't have a lot of gold to begin with. I mean, Canada was a, a weakling when it comes to gold reserves to begin with, but what little they had, they dumped. Um, but little by little, these official sales are drying up. They're down very significantly since uh, they, for, I mean, they pretty much hit the wall in 2010, except for the Canadian sale I just described and the IMF sale. But, but the official sales that we had seen earlier from, you know, some from France uh, and, and the Netherlands and Japan and the UK and, and elsewhere, those have completely dried up and now central banks have become net buyers. Um, not only Russia and China, which are by far the two biggest, but you see uh, Iran, Turkey, Philippines, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, Mexico. These are all countries that are adding to their gold reserves. And, of course, the U.S. hasn't sold any um, since 1980, any significant amount of gold. Now, there's an interesting story there, uh, which I talk about in Chapter 1 of uh, my book, The New Case for Gold, explaining perhaps why the Treasury stopped selling in 1980, because – in uh, 1950, the United States had 20,000 tons of gold. In 1970, we were down to about 9,000 tons. So we lost 11,000 tons during the Bretton Woods period, and mostly to our, uh, to our trading partners. They earned dollars by running uh, trade surpluses to us. They, they sold us, you know, Volkswagens and French wine and Italian vacations and Japanese transistor radios and uh, cameras and a lot of other things. And they ran the surpluses and they cashed in the dollars for gold. So that's how we lost the 11,000 tons. We lost another 1,000 tons in the mid to late 1970s trying to suppress the price of gold. Uh, but then suddenly in 1980, the price of gold exploded, went uh, over the course of from 1971 to 1980, went from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce. So the U.S. kind of threw in the towel, but stopped selling gold. I mean, we had 8,000 tons left. Why didn't we sell another 1,000 tons and another 1,000 tons to, to suppress the price? Well, the answer may lie in the fact that um, how did the Treasury get all that gold in the first place? Well, they took it from the Federal Reserve. But, of course, the Federal Reserve is private and the Treasury is government. And the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says you're, the government is not allowed to take private property without just compensation. 
Um, and so as compensation for taking the Fed's gold, the Treasury gave the Fed a gold certificate, kind of paper gold, that the Fed still has on its balance sheet. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you take the, the Fed carries that certificate at $42 an ounce, uh, which is, you know, the historic cost. Everyone knows that the price of gold is, uh, you know, about 1200 a little bit higher these days. If you take the value of the certificate on the Fed's balance sheet, divide it by $42 an ounce to get the number of ounces, and then multiply that by, um, uh, and, then, and then convert the ounces into tons, what you discover is that the Fed is, has a, an IOU from the Treasury for 8,000 tons. So I think it's interesting, to say the least, um, and perhaps dispositive that the Treasury uh, has held on to 8,000 tons and the Fed has an IOU for 8,000 tons. It looks like the Treasury can't sell any more gold without violating the IOU to the Fed. And if that's true, and I believe it is true, and I explain this in the book, then that means that the U.S. government is out of the game as a seller, um, even though they're potentially the largest seller in the world. So all this is pointing towards tighter and tighter supplies. Now, getting back to your question, uh, Jason, and by the way, I just returned from Switzerland where I met with the head of the world's largest gold refinery. He told, he told me that he's, he's back ordered. That was his customers want more gold than he can sell, than he has, and he's having difficulty sourcing it. I mean, what does a gold refinery do? They take gold in the front door, they process it into a better kind of gold, and then they send it out the back door. Well, so that means he knows all, all the major sellers and all the major buyers in the world because they all do business with him. And he said, you know, China wants to buy a lot more than I can sell them, but I'm working, my plant's working 24 hours a day. I can't sell them anymore. But uh, meanwhile, I'm having difficulty finding the gold in the first place. So you've got these uh, massive, buy, massive buying programs from Russia and China, acute physical shortages, the U.S. out of the game for the reasons I explained earlier, having to do with propping up the Federal Reserve with uh, paper gold. And uh, it's, le it's leading up to kind of the mother of all short squeezes. We'll see how it plays out. But uh, my advice to investors is get your gold now. What are you waiting for? You know, people say, well, I'll wait for the price to go up. Well, it'll go up. Uh, you can count on that, but you may not be able to get the physical gold when the time comes. So the time to get it is now. Now, with China still buying, see, China has an interest in a lower price because they still need another 3,000 tons to catch up with the United States. So if you were, if you were out to buy 3,000 tons, you wouldn't want the price to go up. Eventually you will, but not yet because you're still, you're still a buyer. So I'm not completely confident that the Shanghai Gold Exchange will escape manipulation by the Chinese government because at the end of the day, they still favor uh, slightly lower prices because they still want to buy some. And so my advice to investor is, hey, if, if China is sitting on the price of something that's bound to go up, why don't you get some now at the bargain price? The events going on in the gold market now with the government selling and things like that, it seems similar to the how the London gold pool of the 1960s ended. I think that's a very good point. Uh, and I, I hear this a lot. People say to me, well, Jim, I hear what you're saying, but if if it's all manipulated and there's all this price suppression, why should I buy some? Because uh, they're, you know, these governments, you know, 500 pound gorillas like China are just going to squash the price. How am I as an investor ever going to benefit uh, if the price is getting squashed? And my answer is that gold is being manipulated, but it's been it's been manipulated for 100 uh, over 100 years at this point, at least since 1914, and all the manipulations ultimately fail. So yes, it was uh, manipulated during World War One. It was manipulated um, in terms of price in 1925 when the UK went back on the gold standard. It was you could say the Bretton Woods was a manipulation because they they fixed the price a certain level. The London Gold Pool of the late 1960s was an effort to squash the price. It failed. The U.S. dumped th another thousand tons in the late 70s. That failed. Um, the UK sold their gold. That failed. I mean, so the manipulations are there, but they always fail. And so my view of it is when you see a, a, a manipulation aimed at suppressing the price, it's a gift. I mean, some, some very powerful government is giving you a gift there because they're sitting on the price. Buy it at those levels. And then when the manipulation fails, which it always does, and the price skyrockets, you win. Uh, my next question is, what events will stop the currency wars or coordinated central bank currency devaluations? Well, um, currency wars, first of all, uh, can last for a very long time. The world is not always in a currency war, but when we are, they can go on for a long time. And again, I talked about this in my first book, uh, Currency Wars, uh, that was the title. Um, I show that what I call Currency War I lasted from 1921 to 1936. That's 15 years. Uh, what I call Currency War II lasted from 1967 to 1987, ended with the Louvre Accord. That's 20 years. 
the the current the existing currency war, which started in 2010. I call it Currency War Three. It's six years old. Um, okay, but you know the the first one was fifteen years. The second one was twenty years. So there's no reason to think that this is anywhere near over. Um, and you know, people say to me, uh, you know, it's like 2016, and they say, "Hey, Jim, uh, how did you know in 2011 that we we were going to have a currency war?" They read that there's a currency war going on, and they see my book came out five years ago, and they say, "How did you know five years ago we were going to have a currency war?" And I say, "Well, it's the same war." The, the currency war I was writing about in 2011 is the same war that's going on today. Currency wars don't have a logical conclusion they, because it's back and forth. You know, I devalue, then you devalue, then I devalue again, and then you devalue again. They don't have any, any end game. Uh, there are two ways the currency wars end. One is um, systemic collapse. The other one is systemic reform. So there's sort of a messy ending and a, a hopefully a, a cleaner more logical ending. So systemic collapse, as the name implies, is you know the international monetary system just breaks down, and currency wars are superseded by trade wars or shooting wars or uh, suspension of gold shipments or something extreme that basically freezes the system. And of course, it's very bad economically. Um, systemic reform is when the major financial and trading powers sit down around the table and they rewrite what they call the rules of the game. Um, and there are a lot of calls for that recently. Uh, Rajan, who's the uh, governor of uh, the, the uh, Central Bank of India, but he, you know, okay, Central Bank of India, but he's MIT trained and he's another one of these, you know, modern financial theorists. They're all the same, you know, Fisher and Yellen and Bernanke and um, Draghi. They all went to the same schools. They all had the you know, same four or five schools. They all had the same four or five thesis advisors. They all learned the same stuff. I mean, there's a complete lack of cognitive diversity among these uh, financial elites. But anyway, he did call for um, new uh, what they call rules of the game. Um, I actually uh, discussed this. Um, I mentioned I had a conversation with Chairman Bernanke, uh, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, but I also discussed this with uh, John Lipsky. John's an interesting uh, uh, figure. He was the only American ever to run the IMF. Um, if you know about the whole IMF World Bank uh, custom and practice, the, the head of the IMF is always a, a non-U.S. citizen, a traditionally European almost exclusively French. For some reason, the French have had a lock on the IMF, not just Madame Lagarde, but uh, you know, Jacques Rossier and uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn. I mean, you go back over the names, uh, they're, they're predominantly French. Um, but the Americans have always run the World Bank, uh, you know, Robert McNamara, Robert Selleck, uh, uh, James Wilson, and others. So, um, so that's the deal. But John Lipsky is an American and did head the IMF. But the reason, the reason, it was, he, the reason he did that was because uh, he was first um, deputy managing director, which is an American seat uh, currently held by David Lipton. And when Dominique Strauss-Kahn was arrested on that Air France flight for the little uh, incident in the – well, not so little, I guess, in the uh, in the hotel. So he had to resign uh, abruptly, and the uh, executive committee didn't have a successor in place. So John had to step up as acting head of the IMF. So I spoke to him also. And what was interesting about the, the conversations with Bernanke and Lipsky – they were about a month apart. They were 9,000 miles apart because I talked to Bernanke in Korea and I talked to John in, um, in New York and Washington. And they both used the same word to describe the international monetary system. They both used the word incoherent, uh, which is a very good word, by the way, because it's, it's an apt description. Uh, I know they did not rehearse the word for my benefit, uh, it was just, it, but it was not a coincidence either. In other words, that word is in the air among the global financial elite, and certainly I would include Bernanke and Lipsky in that category, uh, that even the, the people who run the system are looking at us saying, you know, this makes no sense. There's no anchor. Uh, you can have a lot of anchors. You can have a gold standard. You can have a dollar standard. I would say from 1980 to 2010, we were on the dollar standard uh, under James Baker and Robert Rubin. And it's, it's bipartisan. It was Democrat and Republican, Reagan, Bush, and, and Clinton. But we maintained a dollar standard. We said to the world, look, we're going to have a sound dollar and you, our trading partners, can anchor your currency to the dollar in confidence that we're going to maintain the value. And, of course, President Obama tore that up in 2010 with his State of the Union address in January 2010. That was the beginning of the new currency war. But the point being, you could have a gold standard, a dollar standard, a Bitcoin standard, an SDR standard, speaking of special drawing rights, the SDRs. But today there's no standard. None. There's no anchor, and that's what they, it's what Bernanke and Lipsky meant when they said incoherent. Well, that system will go wobbly. That system will collapse. It's just a matter of time. 
there's so many crazy things going on in the world. I can't see why someone wouldn't want to own gold, but there's a lot of people, you know, who in their education, we talked about this earlier in the interview, they, they went to regular, they got A's in their finance, they got uh, finance classes, they got A's in their economics classes, and, you know, they just, it's it's been brainwashed out of them. Well, that's right. I was on, uh, I did a live television, well, I do a lot of live television interviews, but I was on a, a prominent financial uh network uh one time and the anchor i was we were talking about gold and the anchor person said to me well you know my wife uh, collects clay pottery why couldn't we have a clay pottery standard and <laughs> you know sometimes you don't know what to say but i mean the technical answer is because clay pots break and they dissolve in water and gold doesn't break and doesn't dissolve in water i mean there are there are tangible physical reasons why gold is a good monetary standard it's not it's not just that it's shiny. I was on with Joe Weisenthal and on Bloomberg, and he, he he kept referring to gold as a pile of rocks. And I said, Joe, it's not a rock; it's a metal. Uh, but you have these, uh, you know, kind of trite, glib, um, know-it-all type responses. And when you actually probe and do the research, uh, they don't hold up. But people think they do. But it is it is a kind of brainwashing. You're right. Yeah, and gold supply is also very limited, you know, whereas clay pots can be made quite easily. Gold, it's very difficult to mine gold, especially at a profit. Look how uh, the gold miners are struggling right now. Well, that's right, and it's also equilibrating because let's just say, hypothetically, that um, some big new gold discovery was made somewhere, and all of a sudden there was like tons of gold lying around. All the miners ran in, and all of a sudden the gold supply went up. Well, well, what would happen? Well, in the short run, it would be mildly inflationary. Sure, if 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 you're on a gold standard and gold determines your money supply and you find a lot of gold, then that's more money and that should be slightly inflationary. But what will that do? It will increase mining costs, right? Mine, mining is a real activity. You need you need equipment, you need labor, you need geological surveys, you need permits, environmental considerations. Um, you got to get the acquire the land. I mean, it's it's energy intensive. It's water intensive. I mean, gold is a serious hard difficult business and if costs go up then the price of gold goes up and then the mining exploration slows down and that's that's what i'm saying it it, it self-equilibrates the opposite is true if you have a deflationary episode where costs go down that's an entrepreneur is going to say hey here's a good opportunity i'm going to use these low costs and finance some equipment and buy some used equipment from a bankrupt miner and go find some gold so so it it, it responds to normal supply it's not magic i mean it's not um it's not a shiny metal it, it's not a a mystical belief system. It's a very pragmatic, nuts and bolts, get your hands dirty business. Um, same thing with refining. Uh, I love, you know, I, I talk um, a lot about the theory of gold as money, um, and I'm, I'm a financial expert. I don't claim to be a mining expert, but I love talking to uh, real miners, uh, refiners. I mentioned my trip to Switzerland on other ships to Switzerland. I've met with uh, what, what they call uh, senior people and what they call secure logistics. Secure logistics is, you know, vaults, uh, armored cars. I love talking to the people who actually move the stuff around, handle it, melt it down, refine it, uh, you know, dig it up out of the ground. I, I, vis I visited uh, last summer, I visited the Homestake Mine, uh, one of the most famous and productive gold mines in the history of the world. It's it's shut down now. It's actually still used as a, a deep earth uh, research laboratory because it goes down a mile and they can detect uh, neutrinos down there. So it's a lab. But um, but you know, the, I, but the open pit mine is still there and the mine shaft is still there. I was in South Africa not too long ago, a couple months ago, and went down into a gold mine. Uh, so I, I love that end of the business when you see the physical side of it. And I, I also think, kind of going to your point, Jason, that so many of the critics, they're I mean, they're eggheads. They're, uh, you know, they got some academic training. They sit in front of their screens all day. Uh, they repeat the same, regurgitate the same canards and false statements about gold, and they think they know it all. But they never actually go out and, you know, as I say, get get your hands dirty and go down to the mine and talk to people around. But when you do, and I've done all of that, when you do that, what you discover is just how scarce it is, how difficult it is to mine how much shortages are growing. And then you look at the geopolitical side and see what Russia and China, and not just Russia and China, but Iran, Turkey, and others are doing to acquire the gold. You say, man, this just doesn't add up. This stuff is really hard to find. Our enemies are buying it as fast as they can. Um, all this stuff about gold not playing a role is nonsense. And then go back and unlock the mystery of the Fed balance sheet, which I do in chapter one of the, of the book. And you put all that together and then do some basic math involving a money supply, physical gold, in existence, um, what the price of gold would have to be to uh, restore confidence, uh, lost confidence in the paper money system. And that's where you get these prices of, you know, at the low end, $10,000 an ounce or up to $50,000 an ounce. These are not, when I talk about those numbers, they're not 
made up numbers. They're not numbers designed to attract attention or get headlines. Those are the those are the actual numbers uh, that where goal would have to be if you had any kind of goal based monetary system at all. And you know, and I spoke to Paul Volcker about this, and he he said uh, uh, he doesn't favor going back to gold tomorrow, but he said if you did, if you did. Um, the price of gold would have to be enormously high, un unimaginably high, in order to support uh, the money supply. And that's that's another canard. People say, well, you can't have a gold standard because there's not enough gold. That's completely nonsensical. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. In other words, at $1,200 an ounce, uh, right, the gold supply doesn't support world commerce, but at $10,000 an ounce, it does. And so the problem isn't uh, the, the supply of gold. The problem is the price. Uh, and if you – there's no central bank in the world that wants a gold standard. But if you had to go to a gold standard to restore confidence, that's the, the implied – the low end of the implied non-deflationary price range is about $10,000 an ounce. Yeah, and I think you, you've you definitely uh, made a good argument for why our listeners should be more attuned to owning gold and also gold mining stocks. I think the grades of some of these gold miners, you go back decades, the grades just keep falling. So we have to move more and more rock just to get the gold. So for the people out there, it's uh, the, the gold price is going to have to go higher just because we're pulling more gold out of the ground. It's It seems to me like a you know a foregone conclusion. The gold price is going to have to go higher at some right. point. Right. I mean, one or two things will be true. Either the gold price is going to have to be higher to get the miners to dig up more for the reason you mentioned, or if the miners throw in the towel and stop digging it up, the gold price will go higher because of scarcity on the supply side. So either way, it goes higher. Great. Well, Jim, how do our listeners uh, get your book done? Well, it's available right now on Amazon. Uh, just the new case for gold. That's the title, the new case for gold. Uh, it's it's already ranked. Uh, Amazon has all these uh, sub lists. It's ranked number one in their money category. It's ranked number one in commodities. Um, so it's uh, just the new case for gold by James Rickards uh, available on Amazon. And I uh, hope the readers uh, get a copy and read it and enjoy it. And it's also available for pre-order on Audible, the audiobook version. And, and I think you're reading the audiobook? Uh, yes, we have. A, there's a hardcover edition, there's a Kindle edition, and there's an Audible audio edition. And this is the first one of my books where I actually read it. Um, and I, I actually called my publisher and said I want to read it because I, I buy uh, I buy audiobooks myself. You know, they're good for plane rides and long trips and all that. And I enjoy the ones that are read by the author because I always think that, you know, there's some good voice actors out there. But uh, – uh, I think the author can always give it a little more intonation, know what parts to emphasize. So I, I spent a, a couple of days in a studio in um, uh, just near Union Square in New York, uh, reading the book with a with a voice director. He was uh, he tortured me. We, we had a great relationship. We really had fun. But this guy was so demanding, and he'd make me read these things over so many times. But uh, we did. A, we hope hope we did a good job of it. And I hope that.